Persian excursion, a revolt, and an invasion into Europe. Through Marathon, Thermopylae, and Salamis. These are the battles that shaped history. These are the Greco-Persian Wars. The entire Middle East belonged to one master. Its name was Persia. This Achaemenid empire spanned from Anatolia to Egypt to the borders of India and the Scythian territory to the north. Its vast expanse left it with a varying number of people and cultures. This even included Greeks. Though Greek sources were critical of the monarchy-style government of the Persians, the divisions were not quite as stark. Greeks had held high positions in the Persian court. One of King Darius's physicians was Greek. He had also employed stonecutters from Ionia to help build the great city of Persepolis. Mercenaries from Greece were also employed in the Persian ranks. The beginnings of Persian expansion weren't anything to be afraid of, but now they threatened Europe. In truth, the threat had been present since the middle of the 500s BCE. Once Cyrus conquered Lydia, the Greek city-states in Ionia became part of the Achaemenid Empire. Later, once Cambyses took Egypt, this disrupted trading routes for many other Greek city-states. In our last episode, we left off with Darius, the new Persian king, turning his attention westwards, toward Europe. But in reality, he wasn't there to attack the Greeks. He had another target in mind. The Scythians had been disrupting trade routes again, so Darius led a campaign not west, but north, in 513 BCE. He used a pontoon to cross the Bosphorus, and entered Europe. After heading north, he used another bridge to cross the Danube. But the Scythians were always steps ahead of the Persian king, literally. Using hit-and-run techniques, the Scythians kept attacking and retreating, scorching the earth, to deny Darius any use of the land. The Persian king was unable to fight the foe in proper combat. Frustrated, he ordered the withdrawal of his troops, but scored other victories. Not only did the Scythians lose much precious land because of their scorched earth techniques, they lost valuable allies as well. According to Herodotus, this was a win for the Scythians as well, as they remained unconquered, and the presence of a common enemy brought unity to many Scythian tribes. Darius continued back to Persia, but left his cousin, the general Megabazus, in Europe, along with an army. Under General Megabazus, they were to head southwest. The first target on their journey was Thrace. Thrace was a territory mainly in present-day Bulgaria. The Thracians were indigenous to the region, but weren't bound in any sort of state. This made it easy for Megabazus to subjugate the region. It was then turned into a satrapy. When Megabazus turned his sights towards Macedonia, the Greek city-states to the south must have felt panicked. The Greeks had at first seen the Persians as saviors, as they repelled the Scythians, which were an ever-present threat. But now, Macedonia was the only thing between them and the fearsome Persian army. Macedonia, unlike Thrace, was a united kingdom. So perhaps they had a better chance of staving off the invaders. The Macedonian king at this time was Amintas. Perhaps cowardly, perhaps ever cunning, Amintas decided the cause was lost and offered a tribute of earth and water to Megabazus. This was a Persian custom, meaning they were given control of the king's earth and seas. With Thrace defeated and Macedonia now allied, it seemed hopeless for the Greeks but any plans for invasion were placed on hold. 
For now. Macedonia would rise to prominence soon enough, and we'll get to that in our very next chapter, so be sure to subscribe. The Ionian city of Miletus, 499 BCE. Formerly part of the kingdom of Lydia, it was now included in a province of the Persians. Here, the Greek tyrant of Miletus, Aristagoras, would make a play for power. Ambitious in nature, Aristagoras sought an audience with the local Persian governor. His plan, use Persian funds and their army, to take over some of the nearby Greek islands on their behalf. The rationale was to provide safe return of exiled aristocrats, from the neighboring island of Naxos. Organizing a force of over 200 ships, the Persian army headed by Aristagoras and the Persian general Megabartas, came down on Naxos. The Naxians though, had advance notice of the attack, and were prepared. They held out for four months, before the Persians decided to cut funding for the expedition. Fearing for his position, and now in terrible standing with the Persian royals, Aristagoras felt the only way to keep his power was to break free of the Achaemenid Empire itself. In 499 BCE, he incited the Greek city-states in Ionia to rebellion. Perhaps Aristagoras could have a small empire of his own after all. Needing funds for this Ionian revolt, Aristagoras went to the militaristic Spartans for aid. The Spartans refused to get involved in any affairs involving Darius and the biggest empire in the world. Unless absolutely necessary. After Sparta, the obvious choice for aid was Athens. At Athens, Aristagoras would have received the same answer. Except for one variable. If you recall from episode 1 from this chapter of our series, Athens had deposed one of their worst tyrants, but he fled east, to the Persians. With Persian aid, Hippias the tyrant, was set to return. So to help prevent this, Athens was on board. They provided triremes for Aristagoras, while a smaller city-state, Eretria, provided some as well. Unready for the assault, the Persians were caught off guard. Hundreds of ships were commandeered, and Sardis, the Lydian capital, was attacked. The Persian governor retreated to his citadel, but a fire broke out, perhaps accidentally, and the city, one of the most important in the Persian Empire, was burned. Furious, Darius sent his best army to immediately put down this revolt. He's had experience with revolts in the past. In 498 BCE, the Persians caught up with the Greeks. The result was the Battle of Ephesus. After succumbing to volleys of arrows from mounted cavalry, the Greeks were defeated in demoralizing fashion. The Ionians retreated to their own cities on the coast, while the Athenians and Eritreans sailed back to their respective city-states, calling off their alliance with Aristagoras. The burning of Sardis was a point of no return for the Ionians. They had to dig in and keep the revolt going, even expanding it to more regions. Surpassing expectations, the Ionians kept a stalemate against the Persian counteroffensive for years. That is, until a disastrous turning point for the Greeks in 494 BCE. The Persians decided to strike at the source of this rebellion. Having regrouped, the Persians set sail for Miletus and Aristagoras. Their main force was around 600 ships, according to Herodotus, and decisively defeated the Greek forces off the coast at the Battle of Larda. Though the Greeks specialized in maritime warfare, Greek Admiral Dionysus had treated his crew harshly in the lead-up to the war, leading to most Greek ships simply refusing to fight the enemy, with many abandoning the battle. Aristagoras, seeing the end of his failed revolt, fled Miletus, and went north, to Thrace. After setting up a small colony, he met his demise at the hands of the Thracians while attempting to claim more territory. Miletus was then left to the mercy of the avenging Persians, with much of the population killed or enslaved. The revolt was finished by 493 BCE, and Persian territory on the mainland reconsolidated. Back east, Darius was still not satisfied. 
While he began his reign subduing rebellions, the Ionian revolt was long and taxing. Though there was no more reason for vengeance, there was one foe he did not forget. The Athenians and Eritreans put their support behind Aristagoras and aided in the revolt. Naturally, they needed to be punished. Darius planned a full-scale invasion of Greece itself, headed by his general Mardonius, in 492 BCE. A land force was to march through Anatolia, across the Bosphorus, through Thrace, and through allied Macedonia, to strike from the north. A sea fleet was to attack from the Aegean, giving it access to both Athens and Eretria. After a storm destroyed much of this naval fleet, the Persians took two years to replenish their armies, and in 490 BCE, the Persian invasion of Greece began. They were headed by Dartis, a Median nobleman and expert on Greek affairs, Artaphernes, satrap of Lydia, and son of the former satrap, and the old Athenian tyrant, Hippias, seeking to command Athens once again. According to Herodotus, their forces numbered over 600 warships. Their first target was Naxos, the island Aristagoras first attacked. He couldn't take the city in four months, but this Persian fleet took it in a matter of days. Next, they attacked Eretria, a Greek ally in the Ionian Revolt. This city felt the Persian punishment as well, and was sacked and razed. At this point, the Athenians began to panic. They were the foremost Greek polis, along with Sparta. Though a head-on fight with the Persians could be devastating, perhaps an alliance of the two greatest city-states could stave off the invasion. Once the Persians landed in Attica, near the town of Marathon, Athens sent a messenger, Pheidippides, to request help from the Spartans. He ran around 150 miles, or 240 kilometers, in two days, reaching the Spartans during a festival. Unfortunately, during the festival of Carnea, the Spartans were bound by a period of peace and could not offer any help before the next full moon, in 10 days. It's quite possible the Spartans were still trying to avoid conflict with the mighty empire. When Pheidippides returned with the bad news, the Athenians knew they would have to fight the Persians alone. With their 10,000 men, with a contingent of another 1,000 from Plataea, against 25,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, the Athenians needed a plan. They chose a marshy, mountainous location to engage the enemy. This effectively knocked the Persian cavalry out of the fight. Greek general, Miltiades, then set up his hoplite formation with a weak center, and reinforced flanks. After engaging the enemy Persians, the center buckled under the Persian assault. But now, the reinforced flanks had them surrounded in a phalanx sandwich. In a panic, the Persian army retreated to their ships, and huge numbers were killed during the rout. Modern estimates are at around 4 to 5,000 Persians dead, while Herodotus counts only 203 Greeks lost. The remaining Persian ships traveled directly to Athens, so the Athenian forces had to run the 40 kilometers back to their home city. They arrived just in time to see the Persian ships turning away, returning to Asia. And the Greeks rejoiced in their most important victory of their lives. Out of this tale, comes a myth of the runner Pheidippides running back to Athens from Marathon in record time, to announce the Greek victory, before dying of exhaustion. This is what modern marathons base their name and distance off of. While the Persians took more Cycladic islands for the empire during the fight, the Battle of Marathon was a humiliating defeat. General Datis was either killed, or ceased to be mentioned, and Hippias died on the return journey to Persia. Darius spent years preparing for another invasion, only this time, no generals, and no subordinates. He planned to do it himself. His health had other plans. By 486 BCE, Darius's health was declining, and soon after, amidst a revolt in Egypt, he was dead.
The Persian army had been training and preparing for years, but it wouldn't go to waste. The plan to invade Greece fell to his son, a young man named Xerxes. Greece was given respite, as once Xerxes came to power, he had to crush the uprisings his ill father left behind. After swiftly dealing with revolts in Babylon and Egypt, he was ready to face Greece once again for the first time. By 484 BCE, ports all over the empire were building ships, just for this occasion. In Greece, Sparta had been the leader of an alliance of city-states based in the Peloponnese, called the Peloponnesian League. Once Persia became an issue, the Greek city-states banded together, into a bigger alliance, the Hellenic League, which included Athens. The Hellenic League had been preparing as well. Athens continued mastering their fearsome triremes. Hitting silver in their mines at Laurion, in Attica, the Athenians were able to expand their fleet to 200 triremes. This was however, due to the labor of upwards of 20,000 slaves. Xerxes and his army crossed over from Asia via pontoon bridges, built traversing the Hellespont. They then marched through Thrace and Macedonia, reaching Greece's doorstep. Xerxes' march continued on, with his fleet still nearby. Herodotus claimed the Persians had one million soldiers, a number unheard of, and most likely exaggerated. Historians place the real number at around 60 to 150,000, still more than the Greeks could handle. The sheer size of the Achaemenid Empire allowed Xerxes to have his pick of warriors from all over Asia. Phoenicians, Assyrians, Babylonians, even Indians, and other Greeks were part of his army. He also had the services of the Immortals, the elite fighting unit of 10,000 we introduced last episode. In 480 BCE, the Athenian general, Themistocles, devised a plan of defense. To push further into Greece, Xerxes would need to pass through a narrow coastal pass called the Hot Gates. In Greek, it was called Thermopylae. The narrow pass would eliminate the numerical advantage of the Persian army. This task was headed by the Spartans. Themistocles himself would take the Athenian navy and simultaneously block the Persian fleet at the Straits of Artemisium. All Athenian able-bodied men were to man the 200 stockpile triremes. The women, children, and elderly of Athens all moved to safety on the island of Salamis and the Peloponnese. The Greek armies, united at last, was truly a sight to behold. The Spartans blocked the pass at Thermopylae, headed by one of their kings, Leonidas. Said to be descended from the legendary Heracles himself, he was a warrior at heart. Greek forces here were only around 4,000 to 7,000 men, but with the tactical advantage of their terrain, could the Greeks hold off the Persians? Alas, we'll never know. A Greek, Ephialtes, defected to the Persian side. Hoping to be rewarded by Xerxes, Ephialtes showed him a small shepherd's path around the mountain, which the Persian forces could use to bypass Leonidas and encircle the Greek troops. Upon realizing he lost the tactical advantage, Leonidas ordered his forces to retreat. To give the rest of the Greek army to the south sufficient time to prepare, he ordered 300 of his finest men to stay and hold off the Persians. Around 700 thespians also stayed, and it's possible upwards of 900 helot slaves and 400 soldiers from Thebes stayed as well. We don't know how large the Persian force was at Thermopylae, but consensus is anywhere from 70 to 300,000. Once his position was compromised, Leonidas knew the battle was lost, but not the cause. The night before the battle, Xerxes sent a messenger to ask the Greek forces to surrender and give up their weapons. The laconic reply from Leonidas, which would go down in history, come and take them. In all, the battle lasted three days. Apart from the force from Thebes surrendering, the Greeks fought to the death. By the end of it, the Greek forces had lost the battle, and Xerxes' army continued their march south towards Athens. 
Though this battle has been romanticized as one of the greatest last stands in history, in truth the battle itself was of little consequence to the overall war. Though the Persians did lose many of their elite immortal fighting troops, the delaying of the Persian army, a number of troops lost was almost insignificant. A more grounded view of Thermopylae is in its inspirational story. The Spartan kings always had to be first into battle, and last out. It's this heroism that made Thermopylae the most recognizable battle from the Greco-Persian wars. The Spartan courage lived on, even if they could not. Xerxes had Leonidas' body decapitated and crucified. The Persian forces then overran Boeotia and marched into Attica and into Athens itself. Xerxes had the Acropolis burned. From Salamis, those who once called Athens home were forced to watch the smoke from the destruction. The majority of the Greek forces waited at the Isthmus of Corinth, which connects mainland Greece to the Peloponnese, surely Xerxes' next target. The great Persian king was one step away from total subjugation of Greece. Thermopylae was a Persian victory, but what of the naval fight at Artemisium? While outnumbered at sea as well, the Greek triremes were potent weapons, so this battle could have gone either way. It was fated to end in a tactical retreat to Salamis, once Themistocles heard that Thermopylae was lost. His strategy rested on blocking the Persians both at Thermopylae and Artemisium. With Xerxes now in control of all northern Greece, Boeotia, Euboea, and Attica, all he would have to do was wait, and slowly carve down the Greek forces in a war of attrition. Themistocles knew this, so sent a message to Xerxes, telling him where the Greek navy was stationed, and that morale was low. The brash Xerxes immediately sent the navy to block the Straits of Salamis, to block the Greek ships. The Straits proved to be narrow, cramped, and hard to maneuver. This is when the Greek triremes struck. With less ships, the Greeks were more mobile in the waters. Triremes also had rams in front, designed to sink or disable the less maneuverable Persian ships. While the Greeks were naval specialists, the Persians' numbers could have held out. But then Xerxes made yet another grave mistake. Displeased that his eventual victory wouldn't be decisive enough, he ordered many of his captains executed as cowards. This did not sit well with much of the fleet. Many abandoned the fight. His Phoenician captains, seafaring specialists, and experts at naval warfare, sailed home. The Greeks then held the line, and it was the Greeks who had their decisive victory. The Peloponnese was saved. With the threat of being stuck in Greece, and fearing for his life, Xerxes made the journey back to Asia, but left his general Mardonius, who had also served under Darius, to take care of the remaining Greek land forces. The Greeks spent this brief time regrouping. Attica and Boeotia still belonged to the Persians. A year later, in 479 BCE, the Greek coalition of Athens, Sparta, Corinth, and Megara put together their biggest force yet, numbering 80,000. They met the Persian coalition, which also included Boeotians, the Salians, and Macedonians, and numbered from 70 to 120,000. The Greeks were led by Pausanias, regent of Sparta, and nephew of former King Leonidas. The Persians were led by Mardonius. The battle took place outside Plataea, in Boeotia, and the odds were finally in the Greeks' favor. The lightly armored Persian infantry was no match for the Greek hoplites, and its estimated 50 to 90,000 of the invading forces perished. Mardonius himself was also killed. While this battle was going on, the Greek fleet, after their victory at Salamis, chased down the remaining Persian fleet back to Anatolia. The Persians left their ships on the beach and ran to fortify themselves. The Ionian soldiers in the fleet though, defected, and ran back to their home cities on the coast. 
Though the Persians always had more numbers, the Greek hoplites were too heavily armored. This Battle of Makali, so named as it was beneath the mountain of Makali, was also a rout. Most of the Persian navy was destroyed, along with their land forces. The remaining soldiers were chased back to Sardis. Though Plataea and Mikali marked the end of the Persian invasion, and were both decisive Greek victories, it was truly Salamis a year earlier, that was the turning point. The Greeks would look back on this time with pride, as a time when democracy overcame a brutal empire. Both Athens and Sparta came away with untold glory, and would continue to be the foremost city-states in Greece. A period of prosperity, of art, philosophy, architecture, and science began, and classical Greece, the most familiar period of ancient Greece, was upon us. In the backdrop though, there was always trouble. With no common foe, cracks would form. Next episode, it's the dawn of a new empire, an empire that threatens Greece itself. Only this time, the enemy, comes from within. <laughs>